Yellowstone. Oh yes, Yellowstone. It is a beautiful and pristine landscape, a park with many natural wonders and hot springs, geysers, seemingly endless forest, diverse wildlife, and a super volcano. What? You say? Yes, you heard that right. A huge, massive chamber of fiery hot liquid rock, time bomb of death. That super volcano. When you think of a volcano, you think of Mount St. Helens or Kilauea or Mount Vesuvius, Stromboli, and so on and so forth. But you think of that, but think of this super volcano. Think of it of Mount St. Helens, but of gargantuan size. It is with an explosive force thousands of times more powerful than the tested 50 megaton Tsar bomber. Let that sink in. If it still doesn't grasp your concept of mind, think of Mount St. Helens as a little firecracker. You've held those little firecrackers in your hand, and you set them off. It doesn't seem like a much of a big bang, does it? Not much of a boom. Now, picture Yellowstone. Can you hold an atomic bomb in your hand? Of course not. It'd be too heavy. Yellowstone is that atomic bomb compared to Mount St. Helens. Now, when you compare the two between Mount St. Helens and Yellowstone, it's like comparing a firecracker to an atomic bomb. You see, there are two types of eruptions, a red one and a gray one. A red eruption is what you often see on the news. Lava flows, some as slow as a turtle, others as fast as a dog at full sprint. The ones in Hawaii are usually slow, but and they have eject a lot of lava. It's a spectacular show. You'd go there, take pictures, and post it on your social media page, uh, like Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, and uh, you get lots of likes for it. And you would see a lot of video videos from Kilauea dumping lava into the ocean. It's a beautiful sight. You could probably outrun a lava flow from something like Kilauea and whatnot without breaking much of a sweat. The ones in the Great Rift Valley in Africa, however, are technically red eruptions, but are more devastating in terms of speed because some of them are very fluidic and can clock at around 40 miles per hour if, let's just say, a wall of a crater from a lava lake would collapse, like one did in the Rift Valley region of Africa in the 1970s. And it buried a whole amount of people and villages under lava within minutes. Now, another type of red eruption is flood basalts, similar to the one that happened in, in the Rift Valley of Africa, but on a grand scale. Flood basalts categorize under a red eruption, but are devastating in terms of lava flow. These flows could, in theory, travel thousands of miles, pushing at speeds of nearly 30 miles per hour. Now, let's talk about a gray eruption. You understand what a red eruption is. Now, a gray one, yeah, that would be like Mount St. Helens, if you would have guessed it, Mount Pinatubo, Krakatoa, and Tambora. Those are very small gray eruptions compared to the ones I'm about to cover. The worst of these gray eruptions would be something of unprecedented magnitude like Lake Toba, Lake Tupau, and Yellowstone. Now Yellowstone is my main focus in this video because it lies in the United States and affects millions of people. It is also near an area where we have the largest breadbasket in the world, where we produce the most grain and wheat, corn, you name it, in the world. And right beside us lies a super volcano that could blow at any time. Now, deep into the heart of Yellowstone National Park lies a hidden danger. This hidden danger is so massive that you cannot tell that that super volcano is there, unless you see it from the sky or looking from space. Now satellites have pictured this, and you could see the scars from previous eruptions over millions of years, which the latest eruption occurred around 600,000 years ago. But these super eruptions vary greatly. Some may be as small as uh, over a couple miles in diameter, and others could be so large that it could fit the entire city of Tokyo in one super eruption. Now, it is possible that it could have worldwide effects if it was large enough. Yes, even small eruptions like Pinatubo, in comparison, had worldwide ranging effects, like uh, a few degrees drop in temperature. And, but it wasn't on a grand scale that lasted for years. But if something with Yellowstone were to happen, on that larger scale, we could be talking decades of effects. 
The last time Yellowstone erupted was about 600,000 years ago, and around that time, our human ancestors were living in Africa at the time, and they when involved from the ape about 2.5 million years ago. These ancestors witnessed this eruption, but it didn't affect them as much there as it did it in North America. The Yellowstone super eruption extinguished all life in the continental U.S. Now, mind you that there were no human ancestors living in the United States 600,000 years ago, but before the super eruption, life in North America was similar to that of Africa. You had elephants, horses that resembled zebras, lions, and diverse plant life. The effects of Yellowstone had on the Earth was devastating to North America as a whole. It plunged the world into a mini ice age. And for our ancestors in Africa, it wasn't in as impactful as Lake Toba was to Homo sapiens over 70,000 years ago, in which the human bottleneck occurred. Now, 70,000 years ago, Homo sapiens were spreading out across the globe. But when Lake Toba erupted, it caused a bottleneck in which the human population was shrunk down from over a million people down to just a few thousand and caused mass extinctions across the globe. Many species that are not alive today were alive then were just extinguished by Lake Toba. When Yellowstone was formed, it formed from a Yellowstone hotspot referred to as the Snake River Plain Yellowstone Hotspot. It is the same hotspot responsible for large-scale volcanism in Oregon, Nevada, Idaho, and Wyoming in the United States and created as the North American tectonic plate moved across the Yellowstone hotspot. It formed the Eastern Snake River Plain through a succession of calderas forming the hotspot that currently lies under Yellowstone. It is most recent caldera forming super eruption known as the Lava Creek eruption. That one took place around 640,000 years ago and it created the Lava Creek Tuff and the most recent Yellowstone caldera. The Yellowstone hotspot is one of few volcanic hotspots underlying the North American tectonic plate. Others include Anhem and Radon hotspots as well. In 2008, continuing to 2009, more than 500 quakes were detected under the northwest end of Yellowstone, and, and it was over a seven-day span with the largest registering of a magnitude 3.9, and the most recent swarm started in January 2010, after the Haiti earthquake and before the Chile earthquake. With 1,620 small earthquakes between January and February of 2010, this swarm was the second largest ever recorded in the Yellowstone caldera. Now, a lot of people have taken this and made movies out of it. Some have blown this out of proportion. Some have underestimated its potential. And you, sometimes you can't really tell which is the more likely scenario. Well, there's also one scenario that is on the mind of Russian scientists and strategists and military advisors to the Prime Minister of Russia. And it may sound unrealistic, but it's been suggested by scientists that dropping a two megaton nuclear bomb into Yellowstone caldera might release the buildup pressure of magma in the gas chamber and trigger a super eruption. Now let's examine notes from the Russian Doctorate of Sciences and Military Strategist Konstantin Sulkov, that man who works under the thumb of the Prime Minister and the Ministry of Defense in Russia, suggested that the best way for Russia to solve its problem with America would be to trigger a nuclear weapon at Yellowstone National Park in hopes that it would set off a supervolcano destroying the continent. And according to the chief of Russian think tank who wrote in that article at the Russian language VPK news site that a result is that the U.S. would cease to exist. While the rest of the world he noted would suffer a catastrophe, like a mini ice age, Russia would likely suffer little due to the distance from the eruption site, the size of the territory and location. While the stress of such disaster would affect all of the civilization he wrote, such a weapon has the possibility of stopping all thought of aggression against Russia. As crazy as it sounds, this is not impossible, although it may be improbable since the logistics of delivering such a missile or nuke of that capability past early warning systems of the U.S. would be very unlikely, and it's a scenario that I wouldn't lose sleep over. However, what the Russian scientists fail to understand is that detonating something of that magnitude over Yellowstone and it would cause the eruption that they suggest Russia would be affected. Russia gets a lot of its trade from other countries around the world, and food as well. If our breadbasket fails, 
because of this super eruption, Russia would also fail. Their people would starve. Our world is connected by trade. If one country falls that has been almost the center of trade because of the super eruption, it'll affect all the nations around the globe, including Russia. Now let's move on to the realm of more likely and say a super eruption were imminent. What would happen first? Well, this is a step-by-step -step process and we're going to go days or weeks before the eruption hits. What, and what would happen first is, well, we would have warning. Advanced warning probably within a month. This would give ample time for evacuation. message is transmitted at the request of the United States federal government. The supervolcano under Yellowstone National Park is expected to erupt within the next few days, and will cause major damage in several locations. The effects of lava flow, ash fall, and earthquakes are expected to be serious and severe. As of 7 a.m. Mountain Standard Time, an immediate evacuation is ordered for all residents within a 300 miles radius of the edges of Yellowstone National Park. All other Rustians should consider moving away from the volcano towards the ocean coastlines. When the eruption occurs, several events can be expected. A loud noise that can be heard thousands of miles away will be heard. Volcanic ash could reach as far as the Mississippi River as well as all points west of the volcano. Lava will explode out, destroying everything in path in the evacuation area. If you are in the evacuation area, but do not leave, you will face certain death. To evacuate the area in the most effective manner, follow the routes designated by officials. Contraflow may be enacted in many areas, so avoid traveling towards the volcano. Numerous locations will be set up by officials as safe havens. If you do not have a place to protect yourself, go to one of those shelters. Again, an immediate evacuation order has been issued for all residents, within a 300-mile radius of Yellowstone National Park. If you are in this area, leave your homes and businesses immediately. Now, at 30 days before the eruptions, scientists would be fairly confident that a super eruption is imminent, and that the pressure of the magma chamber under the caldera of Yellowstone is reaching critical levels. The chamber itself would probably contain at least 1,500 kilometers of magma, bottled up in that chamber. Now the evacuation of zone of Yellowstone would begin. All western states from Oregon and California to Iowa would all have to be directed to move further east if possible. And maybe those who are stranded in places like Oregon and Washington state might have to either move north towards Canada or Alaska or further west towards oh, near places like Hawaii or Guam. Now, the problem with evacuations on a massive scale, especially with panics such as this, is that gridlock and major highways would slow evacuation efforts. Highways from California and Iowa would be turning into virtual parking lots. As impatience grows over time, motorists would more than likely abandon their vehicles and travel by foot to the east, further hampering evacuation efforts by other drivers trying to get east. This would cause a domino effect among drivers. More and more would abandon their vehicles and start walking. This would become a problem because it takes a long time to walk from one place to another as opposed to driving. If you drove from California to DC, it would take a couple days. Imagine trying to walk from California to Pittsburgh, how long that would take. And you don't have that much time. Now, about 25 days before the eruption would occur, animals near the caldera itself would start to die. The belching carbon dioxide in the ground would kill off livestock in the area, about around 50 kilometers from the epicenter. The trees near the caldera would start to die as well due to the massive amounts of carbon dioxide suffocating the roots in the ground. Animals would begin fleeing the area that are still alive and birds would have completely fled the area. 20 days before the eruption, the ground continues to bulge. Hydrothermal event eruptions would grow increasingly violent and numerous. Landslides on areas that are weak around the caldera would fall into the lake and cause a massive tsunami that would wash ashore 
on anybody that is still there, burying them alive. Now, 15 days before the eruption, earthquake swarms would become noticeable, 50 to 100 miles away, and this would generate more of alarm. These earthquakes would start to become harmonic tremors, which is also a sign that an eruption is about to occur. 10 days before the eruption, the area around Yellowstone begins to haze. Large pockets of carbon dioxide fill the air and choke anything living that is still around the area. Any animals or people that are still that remain in that area would experience oxygen deprivation. Within 50 miles of Yellowstone, it would be increasingly harder to breathe, and those with lung problems, as it is, might even become unbearable. Now, five days before the eruption, small little cracks in the earth would happen from these harmonic tremors and earthquakes. Some hydrothermal vents would ooze out lava and gases to try to release the pressure, but this would also weaken the caldera and would accelerate the process to a super eruption. One day before the eruption, earthquake tremors become the normal. A deep, thick cloud of fog fills the area around the caldera. Lava is oozing out of hydrothermal vents. Cracks in the surface around the caldera continue to expand. Ash begins to fall around the area around the park. And then one vent begins to erupt, an amount of force similar to Mount St. Helens. Millions of times more powerful than that of the regular TNT blast and it would send millions of tons of ash into the air. This ash contains microscopic rock. Unlike ash in your grill or fire pit, this ash is extremely lethal, and when it gets into your lungs, the moisture in your lungs combines with the ash to form a kind of cement concrete that builds in your lungs. And basically anyone caught in this ash will drown in liquid concrete, would appear around the caldera, attempting to release pressure from the magma chamber below. This would weaken the caldera so much that it would blow its top, literally. The supervolcano itself collapses on itself and ejects huge amounts of ash into the air and boulders the size of the Burj Khalifa and crashing down into the earth, sending out large pyroclastic clouds hundreds of miles away, wiping out hundreds of towns and cities within hundreds of miles from Yellowstone Park and sending feet of ash thousands of miles away burying states as far west as Oregon and eastern California to as east as Iowa and Wisconsin. And ashes that would be inches thick would be fallen in places like Altoona, Erie, Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh, and West Virginia. The ash would still be seen falling from the sky in New York as well. The larger the eruption, the further away the ash will travel. The skies in Europe and Asia would begin to be a thick reddish orange. The sun would look like a dark orange light, somewhat similar to a constant sunset, but every day for the next year. The moon would appear pink and then green in the sky and then turn purple. Global temperatures would plunge to 10 degrees Celsius below the average global temperature of today. Now, when Tambora erupted in 1815, it caused a year without a summer in 1816, where snow fell in June and July in places like North America. Now, imagine that but with Yellowstone. This would be three decades long if it happened during a solar minimum, and it could trigger a mini ice age similar to the one that occurred during the Renaissance, which lasted over 500 years. Now, the population of the Earth is about 7 billion today, and if Yellowstone were to erupt, by the end of the year, that population could shrink to below 200 million people it is staggering. I mean, where would you put the bodies? You wouldn't be able to bury them all. There would be nothing left. It's that staggering. And rescue efforts would be hampered by the ash fall that would continue to fall for weeks on end after the initial eruption. And you would have to wait until after the eruption was over to see if you could rescue anybody caught in the ash cloud and could destroy equipment and engines in a plane and I mean it is devastating and you try driving a car through an ash cloud it would choke up the air filters and your car would stop running you could try to walk but you run the risk of suffocating from the ash it would get into your lungs and choke you to death so what do you do do you wait it out or do you keep going well though your best chance is actually to try to keep going as farther away from the ash cloud as you possibly could to get to safety. Now, this would be a generous estimate, but 
15 years after Yellowstone due to the eruption itself, the ash fall, especially affecting those with sensitive lungs like asthmatics and smokers, would trigger that amount of deaths from 7 billion people today. Starvation from the lack of food since America's breadbasket is under several feet of ash and is unrecoverable, especially with 20% of the continental United States becoming uninhabitable for years. And water from all the reservoirs and rivers would be contaminated with ash. You wouldn't be able to drink that water. Now, extreme climate is also the result of a super eruption. The cold alone would kill millions of people around the world and potentially billions, especially those living in places like Norway, Russia, England, Iceland, Greenland, Canada, Alaska. Anybody in the Arctic Circle would cease to exist because the cold would get so devastating that the ice caps would grow exponentially and create glaciers to form. And these glaciers would start to invade areas of Canada because of the cold. It's just one thing, striking scenario that could happen in a super eruption, but it would be on a continental scale. I mean, this is an incident that could happen tomorrow, but it could not happen for another 10,000 years, according to scientists. Now, super volcanoes like Yellowstone have an eruption period of 600,000 years. Every 600,000 years, an eruption would occur. Now, it has been over 600,000 years, and it is long overdue for an eruption, but scientists say it won't erupt for at least 1,000 to 10,000 years from now. So I wouldn't make evacuation plans just yet. Scientists do say that when Yellowstone will erupt, it will show warning signs well in advance before the actual eruption occurs. So, that being said, you got plenty of time to visit Yellowstone, take in the beauty, and get a few selfies of Old Faithful. So what can you take from this video? Well, knowledge is power, and knowledge will help. Be prepared for disasters and events like this. That way, it could save lives someday when something similar were to happen. Be prepared well in advance and know what to expect when something like this occurs. And share this video along with your friends and let them know that these things do exist. I mean, they may not happen tomorrow, but having the knowledge of these that could happen would help you be better prepared for a disaster if it were to happen. Well, thank you for watching, and please don't forget to subscribe to this channel, Iron Tusk 341. If you haven't already done so, please subscribe for more and click that alert button beside the subscribe so when I upload a new video, you would be notified on your mobile phone. Also, if you haven't already done so, please check out my page on Patreon. Without your support from watching and subscribing to these videos, these videos would not have been possible. Again, I thank you, and I thank you again. Thank you for your patronage.